My name is Charles Darwin. Readings from my book on the origin of species. When on board the HMS Beagle as a naturalist, I was much struck with certain facts in the distribution of organic beings inhabiting South America and in the geological relations of the past to the past inhabitants of that continent. These facts, as will be seen in latter chapters of this volume, seem to throw some light in the origin of species. That mystery of mysteries has been called by one of our greatest philosophers. On my return home it occurred to me in 1837 that something might perhaps be made out of this question by patiently accumulating and reflecting on all sorts of facts which could possibly have any bearing on. After five years' work, I allowed myself to speculate on the subject and drew up some short notes. These I enlarged in 1844 in a sketch of the conclusions, which then seemed to me probable. From that period to the present day, I have steadily pursued the same object. I hope that I may be excused for entering on these personal details as I give them to show that I have not been hasty in coming to this decision. So Charles Darwin talks a lot about natural selection and descent with modification. Really what he means is all organisms have variation. And we know that because we just talked about alleles. We just talked about characters and uh, various forms of a gene, uh, alleles, which can be inherited by um, both of an offspring's parents. And we also learned that the inheritance of these genes follows certain patterns which lead to uh, phenotypes of the offspring. So the phenotypes of the offspring are determined by the genotype, which are then determined by the inheritance of specific alleles of specific characters um, on those genes, on chromosomes. So Darwin didn't know anything about this, but he did know that all organisms have variation. So when, when Darwin was talking about evolution, what did he mean? Well, evolution technically means a change in the allele frequency of a character or characters of a specific population over a period of time. Again, that the change in the allele frequency of a character or characters over time of a population. So look at this population of whelk whelk shells here. All these organisms, uh, they are marine organisms that live in the sand and reproduce uh, on the ocean floor. As you notice, these are all the same species of whelk. We have white, we have uh, organisms that are white, we have organisms that are yellow, we have organisms that are black and white, organisms that are black and yellow, and all different organisms that are more black than anything else. So all these are different variations of a characteristic, which is a whelk shell color. So in this example, there are probably many different genes that influence whelk shell characters, also called polygenic inheritance. And all of these influence how the organism actually survives in the environment. So um, we have a population of whelk shells here in the, above, in the, above, in the picture to the right. And let's show a, a, a possible example of what the ocean floor looks like in a specific location. You have a sandy ocean floor with a light color. What's likely to happen is that the organisms, the whelk shells, the, or the whelk organisms of this population that are more likely to survive are generally going to be those that can avoid the predation. So avoiding predation is going to be important to uh, being able to reproduce and being able to pass on alleles to the next generation. Now I guarantee you the lighter colored whelk shells here are going to blend in to the environment much better than the darker colored whelk shells. In response, the lighter colored whelk shells will then have a greater chance of passing on their alleles to the next generation by survival alone. Now if we change that environment and have a muddy bottom, all right, the sun's hitting this mud, but the mud itself is a darker color, then the whelk shells that are carrying alleles and genes that display a phenotype of a, a darker phenotype are more likely to survive than those displaying the whiter phenotype. In this environment, the population of whelk shells that are most likely to survive are the ones with the dark color. And this is exactly what Darwin looked at. Darwin looked at different organisms 
you looked at their variations, and over a long period of time deduced the idea that variations in populations are what lead to change over time if the, pop if the ecosystem or the environment changed. Organisms have only a few decisions to make. They don't make the decisions themselves, but they have, on, they have only a few responses to their environment. Number one, organisms can respond to their environment through variation and selection of specific traits that allow them to become more adapted. They cannot change at all, and they may die. So there are only two choices that organisms can make. And the ones that can adapt and change with changing environmental characteristics are the ones that will live on to pass their genes to the next generation. Now, Charles Darwin wasn't exactly the most original with his ideas. Although Charles Darwin was the first person to put these ideas that organisms may be able to change over time into words. And, of course, Charles Darwin gave more evidence than anyone had done before for his theories on evolution, natural selection, descent with modification. But let's look at some of the people that influenced Darwin in his theories on evolution. And one of them was Lamarck. All right, Lamarck had a theory that he called the theory of acquired characteristics. And in this theory, an organism could change during its lifetime depending on its need to do so. An example would have been giraffes. According to Lamarck's theory of acquired characteristics, a giraffe, by trying to reach further and further up at the branches and the trees, actually, over its lifetime, extends the length of its neck. Also, he... His ideas said that this same giraffe that increased the length of his neck over the lifetime over trying to reach for higher branches when resources were scarce could pass on these acquired traits to the next generation and that the next generation would then also have longer and longer necks. And this was his theory on why giraffes have long necks. One of the problems with this theory, though, is that this isn't ju that just isn't the case. Giraffes don't grow their necks after a certain age, and a, they definitely don't get longer necks based on the need to do, do so. If this was the case, any organism that wa sp that wanted an adaptation or tried harder for an adaptation could gain that adaptation. It would mean that a cheetah could run even faster than it does because it wanted to run faster, or that it needed to run faster. So this theory on the the acquired characteristics was accur accurately stating that organisms change over time, but the mechanism by which they change was a little bit off. But, on the other hand, Lamarck's theory of acquired characteristics was important in setting the stage for others to offer uh, different opinions and theories on the changing of organisms. But don't forget at this period of time that the the idea that organisms could change over time or that the idea that organisms weren't, weren't, weren't created by God as they were and immutable or unchangeable was the accepted theory at the time. So these these theories themselves uh, were under uh, lots of scrutiny uh, during the 17 and 1800s. Take the example of this blue, of the blue crabs here. All right? The descendants over here are, are uh, population number one, all right? Population number two has lots of variation in these individuals. The variation meaning that phenotypically the organisms are not all the same, all right? Now, over time, an organism may develop an adaptation which would allow it to better survive in the environment. This adaptation, which is in, which inherited genetically, if beneficial, will be passed on to the next generation by those individuals that carry the allele or phenotype for that adaptation. Therefore, the organisms will better able to survive in the future. In this case, an organism with a mutation of a very, very large organ, all right, claw, for example, 
um, will mate with organisms uh, that do not have it at all, and the response is offspring that also have a larger than normal adaptation. Now, some adaptations arise from variation in the, in the population, and some adaptations will arise from mutations. All right? These are two different sources of, of variation in the population. Um, natural variation, which exists in populations, versus mutations, which may lead to beneficial adaptations. But not all mutations will lead to very uh, adaptable or, in other words, adaptations that will help them. If we continue on, this next guy, uh, uh, Thomas Malthus, our, um, also known for Malthusian economics, uh, was important to Darwin because Darwin read some of his works in a book called Essays on Populations. And here's how it goes. In, Thomas, in Charles Darwin's words on the origin of species, in October 1838, that is, 15 months after I'd begun my systematic inquiry on the descent of organisms and evolution, I happened to read for amusement Malthus on population. And being well prepared to appreciate the struggle for existence which everywhere goes on from long-continued observation of the habits and animals and plants, it at once struck me that under these circumstances, favorable variations would tend to be preserved and unfavorable ones would be destroyed or eliminated in the population. The results of this would be the formation of a new species, hence adaptations. Here, then, I had to at last get a theory by which to work, Charles Darwin from my biography. Thomas Mathis said that populations are designed to struggle, or that overpopulation leads to strife, overpopulation leads to struggle, overpopulation leads to death and famine. Charles Darwin took this idea and said that if organisms are overpopulated, which they are, then the struggle for existence would create a competition that leads to those organisms that are better surviving to reproduce or at least continue living. So overpopulation leads to organisms struggling or competing to exist. And this competition leads to the ones that are more beneficial at adapting and passing on their genes through reproduction. Next we have a man that we all know very well, Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel wrote a uh, paper called Theories or Experiments on Plant Hybridization, um, which was read by no one until a long time after his death. But we talked about the idea of there being different alleles for a character, for in this, exa this example of pea plants is height, and that alleles are passed on the next generation and inherited as discrete characters. So even though these plants, all right, appear to only appeared only to be tall, which they are, they also have alleles from the short plant, which are then manifested in the F2 generation of the 3 to 1 ratio of a monohybrid cross. So now we're looking at Gregor Mendel, Thomas Mathis, and Lamarck on his theories of acquired characteristics, all setting the stage for these theories on evolution to become more prominent in the society. And let's not forget about Darwin. Darwin had help on his own as well. Darwin looked at these finches on islands called the Galapagos Islands, which we're going to talk about more. The Galapagos Islands were islands off the coast of South America, which were created by volcanic activity. Actually, if we go, we, if we go here, we can actually look at the islands themselves. Let's say um, Galapagos Islands. Here, Darwin sh showed that there were eight different, that were at least 12 different species of finches on these islands called the Galapagos Islands. These species of finches, finches all came from the same place in South America. All right? So these species, the original species, came from South America and somehow made it over to these Galapagos Islands, which were volcanic islands, which basically arose out of the ocean. Darwin said, why is it that there are so many different types of bird that vary, but they're all finches? So Darwin went to this guy named Gould, and Gould, let's take a look at Gould here. 
let's say Gould. Let's see what he looks like. Benches. Um, let's see, we get a picture here. I think his name is John. John Gould. This is his name. All right. John Gould was known for telling Charles Darwin that, hey, Darwin, these finches here are not one species. These finches are not one species. What does that mean? Well, that means that all these individuals are related in some way, but their phenotypes are different. Well, the reason for that is that they all live on different environments of these islands of the Galapagos. Each finch has adapted to a specific micro environment and over time their phenotype has changed to match that adaptation. Darwin's theories came from these finches of the Galapagos Islands and John Gould was the ornithologist who said, Darwin, you have 12 different species here. You do not have one species that varies, you have 12 different species. And Darwin said this, well, I know that all these, all these birds came from one finch on the mainland of South America. And so he said that actually species can change. This is called speciation. Right. Wallace is an important man. Wallace was studying uh, natural selection in Central America at the time and was one of the driving forces in getting Darwin to release his information on his view of evolution because Wallace had already figured out the same thing and wrote, and wrote to Darwin about his theories. These prompted Darwin to publish his theories in the book on the origin of species. Here we have a cantaloupe 